Uh, so I've got a question. Like sometimes, and uh, especially when uh, maybe when you start practicing, and you practice very very hard, yeah, and uh, you get really obsessed by your practice, and like for a while, I mean after a while it comes down, but you know like sometimes it takes a long time to calm down, and instead of being like more compassionate or accepting, you become more and more judgmental. So I'm just wondering like uh, how you get out of that. If you just, I mean, it's just a phase very often, yeah? If you wait long enough, it goes. But <laughs> sometimes it lasts a long time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is how do we overcome that? I, I'm, I couldn't, my yeah. hearing's not so good. Uh, how do, do we uh, maybe like get out of this state of, you know, even though you practice extremely hard, yeah. uh, but out of this state of being somehow so obsessed with, I don't know if it's your practice or yourself, mm. that you don't have much compassion or, you know, like this... Um, yeah this way of putting yourself back and kind of thinking, okay, you know, I can down, just observe. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, when, we, when our dharma is strong, our practice is strong, our demons, our karmas also getting stronger. That's, that's the real, that's one of the main challenges. And uh, so sometimes when people practice strongly, and many times when we begin, we do, we really make an effort, uh, we get a little, we get, we're getting something from it. But it, sometimes what also happens is our opinions getting stronger, or your desire is getting stronger, or checking others is getting stronger. Uh, that's when this... Uh, commitment, this uh, intention to overcome those things really becomes important because yeah. uh, those are hindrances. And what's shocking is they come from inside. You know, there's outside hindrances, but the most difficult ones are the ones that come from inside. And uh, just have to digest the teaching, and try more. Uh, if you don't, and you start to have a lots of opinions, uh, eventually you'll cause a lot of suffering for others or for yourself. And that may return you to correct practice. So sometimes people, there's two ways in which people tend to stop and pull back. One is get comfortable. We overcome some of our suffering, and it's like, oh, okay, things are good now. I can go out and fulfill what I want to do. <coughs> and the other way is our opinions or our desires just get stronger and stronger. And those are, are uh, two obstacles that appear. And... Uh, that's why it's important that our practice not just be, not be based on emotion, but having a clear view of, of the situation of the world and of myself. Um, with Sanims, uh, Zen Master Sung San would often say there's two kinds of Sanims, feeling Sanim and correct Sanim. Feeling sanim is, you know, I have some feeling and I want to become, I just want to devote myself to practice and cut my hair and leave the usual route that my parents took, say, of uh, getting partners, getting careers and things. Um, maybe I've heard some people uh, go to some mountain and they say, oh, I felt such a connection with that mountain where there's a temple and I just want to live there. Um, or uh, I had bad suffering and now I'm practicing and uh, then I'm not suffering so much now. And I want to do more, you know, I want to do something else. Um, uh, 
any feeling, any situation, even your body condition changes. If your motivation in doing anything, you know, getting married or doing a career or something is based on feeling, when the, those things change, your direction's broken, whatever it is. Uh, but if you, like a correct sneem, perceives this world, everything's impermanent, everything's suffering, and although if I look at myself, there's a lot of I, actually, there's our true nature's non-self. That I is made up by my mind. I make that. It doesn't really exist otherwise. If we see that, and then we see our job. And everybody's job can be a little different. You know, somebody's devoted to their family, devoted to their work. You know, people are teachers, nurses. Uh, so many jobs can be bodhisattva jobs if we have the right attitude. I always think about taxi cab drivers. I don't know why. <laughs> like, if you're a taxi cab driver that just does your job for others, that's amazing. You know, but that's enough right there. And you take care of your family, and you do this, and you do that, and, and uh, you, your actions in your life is uh, for others. Uh, that's, that's enough. But that's rarely the case for any of us. So somebody who sees, for me, it was just like things got to a point where I saw in my uh, late 20s, early 30s, oh, all I want to do is learn Buddhist practice, and help others be able to practice. At the time, it meant uh, help a community exist, any kind of job. I remember once washing dishes and being all bummed out by it. And then I thought, well, I, I remembered uh, the year after I was in college, I was living with two guys, and they were art students. And we had a double sink. And the way we would do our dishes is when both sinks filled up with dirty dishes, we'd wash them, you know. I imagine young women didn't do it that way, but we were three guys. And it would take a few days, and then there's no more cups, no more plates, you know. And then we'd wash everything. And I was washing dishes at Providence End Center, feeling like, why don't we just leave them in the sink? You know, these are deep sinks. <laughs> take a few. And then I thought, well, if I wash the dishes in my own apartment, it's just for me. But if I wash them here, I'm helping 30 or 40 people. And I thought, that's kind of cool. You know, of course, I have 30 or 40 more dishes to watch, but it's kind of cool. And then you use the practice to just do it. Pay attention. And, and ultimately, I think when we do that, there's a certain deep satisfaction and joy. You know, when Sung San Sinim died, his last year was really hard physically. And if he thought about it, it was probably hard because, you know, he loved teaching. He was really good at it, really, really good, so that he could connect with people everywhere he went, different cultures, he loved connecting with people from culture he had never met, and try to, who are you? And who am I? Who are we? And then direction, giving direction, you know? And then he couldn't do that. But when he died, I felt like he was smiling. I was with him when he died, you know? And he looked like he was smiling. And I mentioned this uh, at Hwagisa after they cleaned off his body so nicely, so respectfully. You know, there was a cloth over it so you don't see him. Which, you know, I saw him all the time in the bath thing. But you know, a dead person you want to treat respectfully. And uh, he was lying on this table, and we were going around chanting. And every time I chant past his feet, I'd look at his face, and it was like he was saying to me, I did my job. You know, if you can die feeling like, I did my job, I did my best, I tried hard, let's see what happens next. You know, that's amazing. You know, that's incredible. That's, that's true happiness and satisfaction. So even if you're your body's suffering or something, but you really have your direction clear and you're making that effort, uh, there's a deep satisfaction. And that can happen in many uh, areas of life. Uh, 
but can you extend it to every moment of your life? You know, basketball players, football, you know, Americans say soccer players, sometimes they're incredible. They kind of understand where each one is going without even knowing. And they, they you know, harmonize sometimes so well. But that might be the only moment in their life they can do that, you know? And can we do that moment to moment to moment? And it's, if we have that intention, whether you're a senior or a lay person, there's no unemployment, you know? There's no, oh, there's nothing to do. There's always something to do. And it doesn't mean you have to get up and go around. I mean, I just took a nap for 10 minutes. Mandu was, I heard him outside my room. And, and then I hear this noise. My window is closed, but he had jumped up and he's like banging his head against the window while he's hanging by his claws, you know. His body's hanging down the side of the building. He's like, kind of like, open it already. <laughs> so I open it and he comes in and then he decides there's a cushion in my room. He, he had never gone on it before. And he's looking at me, smelling it, looking at me. And I didn't do anything, so he climbed up. And then I went my laid down on my bed and I was in it. And I opened my eyes and then he already had his eyes closed. So, you know, we took 10 minutes there. And uh, that's, that was the job. I was doing some mantra and the next thing I knew the alarm went off, you know, 10 minutes later, time to get up. And uh, then he looks at me like, oh, do I have to get up too? <laughs> so he stretched out and I left the window a little open. He'll leave when he feels like it. <laughs> so, even when you're resting, how are you keeping your mind that moment? You know, that's, that's, that means there's always a path. There's always a, a clear and beneficial direction in life. And the biggest problem in the world now is people don't have a real direction. You know, people have a direction like, you know, I want to be number one, or I want to be this, or I want this or this. But that's, that's just all temporary stuff. If we have this big direction, then we can use the temporary stuff according to whatever situation we're in or what your body condition is. You always have a real direction. That's amazing. So the same thing when these hindrances appear, you know? And one thing the Six Patriarchs said is, when you start blaming, you have to recognize that. And my experience is as soon as I have this blame mind, I'm not, I'm off. I know I'm off. You just have to catch it first. Whoa. Uh, because you're not keeping your own correct situation. I mean, maybe it is. Do mantra. Why are you checking somebody? If you don't have the wisdom to help them at that moment, then practice more, whatever that might be, practice more. And if you don't have the wisdom, then you go back to, uh, back to your practice, back to don't know, back to where is my hindrance? Where is my hindrance? Yeah, so that's what's challenging. And when somebody would leave, either because they got a little comfortable, or no, that's enough, or because, you know, they started checking everybody and deciding, making lots of opinions about people. Then sometimes we'd ask something, oh, well, why this person leave? They're practicing very hard. And sometimes he would say something, but sometimes he would just say, more suffering necessary. So we will definitely lead ourselves to more suffering at some point if we follow that thinking mind. Uh, one time, also, I remember in Cambridge, uh, Zen Center, during a Dharma talk, somebody asked him, I've been living in the Zen Center a few years. I, I work outside. I don't have a, you know, a, a spouse or kids yet. This is a young person, they said. Uh, but um, I see some people come here for three days and leave. Some people stay for a year practicing every day and leave. And once in a while you see an older student, even 20 years, stop practicing. What's that? And Sansanim said, one day, one year, 20 years, 
doesn't matter. When somebody stops practicing, it's just between them and their demon. You know, you and your I, my, me mind. You and your opinion or your desire or your ignorance. So that's, it all comes back to, yeah, so it, it's hard. Uh, George Bowman was one of the first two Incas in Sansini school, and I remember one day he said, the reward for hard training is more hard training. <laughs> You know, we know Sung Sansini did this outrageous retreat that most people couldn't even do or even survive. And then many things after that. There was the Korean War and there was, uh, you know, trying to revive Korean Buddhism. And then he went to the West. And, um, you know, many opportunities to stop. There was, I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling to, like, follow what I'm saying sentence by sentence here. Uh, oh, I know. So very difficult things. But one year, it was the second year I was living in the Zen Center, 1977. It just seemed to me like a great year. We, we were, you know, I was also working outside at that time with some of the guys from the Zen Center, but we were making this nice Zen center and, and fixing things up and taking care of this building we had bought and having retreats and, and you know, lots of daily practice. You know, most nights were double sittings and, and weekends were double sittings each morning at a normal, that was a normal thing. And, um, and Sung Sansini went to Europe for the first time with seven students. They went because he had been invited to Poland, and then he added other countries just to visit and try to meet with some people who might be interested in practicing. And in September, he took the first big group to Korea, about 40 people for a month. And I didn't go on either of those trips, but uh, his secretary was an American woman. And at the end of the year, she, she told me, and he just seemed so bright all year, uh, she said, oh, Sansanim said to me, this has been the most difficult year of his life. Consider, <laughs> isn't that amazing? Considering what he had been through. And I thought, wow, dealing with us was hard training. And he made it seem wonderful to us, to me. And he was very bright in everything. So yeah, the reward for hard training is more hard training. But um, that's better than going the other way and digging yourself deeper into uh, suffering, you know, which is harder to back out from at a certain point. It gets hard to back out from that. I mean, we got this far. That's amazing. So wherever you go, keep on going. Only go straight, don't know. You know, if we have this intent, every human being has this inside. It's, it's just, do we become aware of it? This bodhicitta, we have that. If we become aware of it, nurture it, take care of it. Yeah, so it's true. That's exactly what happens. You run into more, oh my God, from yourself as you practice art. But I think with Sung San Sanim, and maybe Kobong Sanim saw this right away, he's not going to stop trying. I have this feeling that when he met Kobong Sanim, you know, already enlightened, you know, it would be easy for him to think like, oh, you know, okay, I gave my tea. This, he wasn't even his teacher. Kobong Sanim, I hand him this, this smoke top. What is this? Kobong Sanim hit it. Then San Sanim thought, oh, that's my answer. So my mind and the Zen master's mind is the same. And he turned to leave. And then Kobong Sanim said to him, what did you see, a building, an airplane, a bird? And then San Sanim turned around and said, thank you very much. You know, some, you ask somebody a t question, they answer you, you don't say thank you. You just turn around and walk away. So that hit San Sanim. Then Kobong Sanim asked him, what kind of practice did you do? And that's when San Sanim became his student and realized even he got this huge enlightenment on his own, you know, I can learn. That's amazing to me, that's really incredible, you know. 
And, uh, and that benefited all of us. So thank you, Kobongson, for that little whoop. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Sansanim, for catching the value of it. Yeah. Since this is the last uh, formal Dharma talk during Kyoche, we have a few more days of sitting. We have cleaning meditation, which the Hangwans have been doing all winter. We do a little bit every day, but soon we get to do a lot. That'd be so great. And um, uh, I thought of uh, one, one response also to a question that, Sung Sansin gave in Cambridge Zen Center also. Uh, one man during a Dharma talk said, Sir, I've been practicing for three days. Can you give me any advice to help my practice? Then I remember uh, Sansin said, uh, How many days? The man said, Three. Then Sung Sansin said, Too long. <laughs> <laughs> then what? He said, Three days, 20 years, doesn't matter. Moment, very important. How do you keep your mind moment to moment? So we don't need to think about, you know, oh, there's this many days left of this or this many hours today of this or this kind of uh, activity, sitting, meditation, or this kind of activity, scrubbing the kitchen floor. We don't need to think about that. And time and space, we just, this moment, this moment is everything. And so in Zen, we say, if you attain this moment, you attain everything. So let's uh, use this moment and every moment that appears uh, with the same intentions, the best intentions that each of us has had during this practice time and strengthen that, strengthen that intention just by doing it. You know, what you do becomes stronger. You know, if you lie a lot, it becomes easier to lie. If you mistreat people, you will continue to do it unless something really hits you. But if you make this practice effort with our mind, this moment, that strengthens that. So that's why, you know, we say, try, try, try. So uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful that uh, each of us uh, choose to make this effort. And um, let's strengthen that intention, whatever circumstance uh, we find ourselves in. And that will benefit us and benefit everybody. <laughs>